Steve, uh, I'll go back to you and I, and I'll start with you because you and I began talking about, frankly, the enterprise opportunity for what 5G meant years ago. You That's were right. talking to me about it. It was at the time when you were actually, before you even tried to buy NXP, I won't bring that up more than that, um, but the opportunity in terms of the Internet of Things, in terms of how many chips were going to be in different things, for lack of a better term, and what it meant for the uh, another industrial revolution. So let's start there. Where are we on that timeline, as opposed to Hans, who keeps rolling out new cities with or, or regions with 5G? Where are we on the industrial timeline for the applications of 5G? Sure. So if you look at the industrial timeline, it really comes in a second wave. The first wave, you're, you're getting the, you know, the, the so-called more G phase of cellular. But the real exciting part is, and the part with the huge economic potential, is the Internet of Things, or really digitization. Every major industry is trying to figure out how do they deal with the data and the digitization of their infrastructure, their products, their customer data. Increasingly, more and more of that is, is wireless or is connected wirelessly. And if you look at the economic benefit, we did a study or commissioned a study, and I think it was something like 12 point something trillion dollars worth of economic value by 2035 will be enabled by 5G. The majority of that will be outside of the cellular space. What you're seeing is you're seeing uh, a change in technology, not unlike uh, electricity or coming into factories. The, 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 the change in the way industry will work and the way infrastructure will be controlled will be dramatic. And that's why you see governments so interested in this transition. And I want to talk a bit about that as well. But give me an example. Give our viewers a sure. hard a world example, even if it is a number of years away as to what you're talking about when you talk about that transition. Well, you're going to see connected health care, for example. Uh, the delivery of health care in the United States, which is a large percentage of the GDP, it's mid, you know, high to mid-teens worth of the GDP, a small improvement in the delivery of that health care, just the monitoring of people and how you impact their lives, tremendous economic benefit and tremendous benefit to, to people. And it's because you can connect people and, uh, you know, you really get the telematics off of how they're living and you can control the, the, the outcomes for health much better. Same thing happens in transportation, same thing happens in education. And then on top of that, just how do I deal with the impact of the cloud to business, which I have some great colleagues here who know better than I do, but that's all enabled by the 5G uh, revolution. Right, and we're going to talk a bit about the cloud and what it's going to enable in terms of the lack of latency and the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but Hans, how important is this longer term for Verizon? Uh, you know, when you have when you show up with us on there or you do an analyst meeting or a quarterly yeah. call, most of the questions are not about this opportunity as much as they are about, okay, is Apple going to have a phone? And when is the five, when are you rolling out in this area and will millimeter wave spectrum work? So what about this larger opportunity? I, I go back a little bit because when the design principles was done on 5G, which was a lot of discussion, remember 2D to 4G was only two capabilities, throughput and speed, better from 2D to 3D, 3D to 4G. When 5G was designed, the whole idea was actually to, how can you enable enterprise and society, uh, as Stephen said. And, and much of it became eight capabilities. I mean, enormous and low latency, battery lifetime, enormous throughput, secure uh, transactions on the network. And of course, much of that was designed for enterprises. And, uh, and today we are spending a lot of time on that. I usually talk about that we have four business cases on 5G, which is unheard of. One is mobility. That's what we're building out in, in the cities in the US right now. The other is 5G home, we do broadband to the home with 5G instead. And the third one is clearly mobile edge compute, where we bring 5G to the edge for enterprises. And the fourth one is cost. It's always cheaper to transport data in the next generation network. When we talk about 5G mobile edge compute, that's the third launch we have. We have launched home, we have launched mobility, and we're launching 5G mobile edge compute in this year in you the will, fourth quarter. In, in the fourth quarter of 2019. Yes, that's been committed already in the earlier. So the first mobile mobile edge compute centers based on 5G will be this year. So we're going to have customers using it. Then, of course, we, we're bringing it further out. And, of course, the customers that we heard Steven talk about is a lot about how do you transform a factory having it all 5G? How do you do a, a warehousing being with 5G with all this ubiquitous coverage and speed and throughput and latency? So... I spend a lot of time with all the large enterprises to understand the platform, and then, of course, with partners like IBM, etc., how they come in with their softwares, because it's going to be a combination of it all in order to deliver a service. Right, and I, I think a lot of people are trying to understand 
the different responsibilities yes. and or opportunities. Um, Jenny, let me come to you because, I mean, the last time we spoke on air, I think was in mid-July, and you had announced your, uh, the AT&T, or it may have been the Red Hat closed, but it, was, yes. it was around the announcement of the AT&T strategic alliance, yes, multi-year yes. alliance. You said at the time in the press release as well that 5G enterprises will one day be able to rapidly transmit data to and from multiple clouds and billions of edge devices with increased reliability and security reduce latency, as, as Hans just indicated, and eventually this will help businesses transform the user experience, optimize processes across industries from retail yep. to financial services, transportation, manufacturing. What does that actually okay. mean? So um, with my colleagues here and the work we've done with Hans as well, um, if you're a company, this actually does, by the way, open up two big markets for IBM, I'll come back to, but just the enterprises I deal with, it's the convergence of a couple things they've talked about. The 5G, which everybody just thinks big bandwidth, low latency, real quick, but you also have two other things happening at the same time. Networks, yep. like, like Hans, are cloudifying, if I can use that word, cloudification, so that they can quickly put software-defined services up fast. And the third thing he mentioned, which was this edge computing. So what does that mean to a company? It means that I could almost do real-time analytics anywhere. So I actually believe with 5G, the biggest impact will probably be, I think we all agree, enterprise first. Yeah. And even in an enterprise, in some cases, it may likely be what I call fixed campus, kind of in a perimeter. It'll be the easiest way. And some, to me, some real quick examples of things we are already working on. So as an example, Steve mentioned healthcare. My mom was recently in the hospital. Try, I spent a week coordinating moving big files from each healthcare provider. Or you go to a remote surgery. Internet 4.0, picture walk in a factory and it's wireless. Think of all the wires, the cables, and what it could mean to safety and maintenance. That's one that they're working on. A retail store. Okay, if I could really look at all that video real time, I could stock shelves differently. If I am a car, car to car, um, for safety reasons, the two cars are communicating. That's another one we're working on. Um, the other one would be if you think about first responders. We're working on one with, with drones and with what would you do with wildfires? Is airports, it's security. So I actually see those use cases everybody's working on right now. And the two, if I can just throw in the two big spots for us, one is, as Hans said, um, these networks, part of it is they have to cloudify. His yeah. networks will cloudify. He's working on that. Absolutely. As our, what that means, every what, 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 well, what it, cloudifying I, means. Well, you go. Okay, I'll give you my simple, but he's an expert on obviously our own networks. But every network is becoming software defined. So instead of being really uh, hardware with its own specialized software, difficult to change, they're going to make it like a cloud and that they can put up new services very easily. I think that's kind of an easy thing to understand. But networks are things that have to be really reliable. Yeah. So big opportunity for us. We've never been a network provider. But with Red Hat, they're in 120 of the telcos around the world, so we're the basis to begin to be the cloudification of that network. Right. And then the second one is, and this is really how Hans and I were doing a lot of work, is those enterprises. You, he'll need systems integrators to come help build those new, these are really brand new applications that are out there, right? So on one hand, he'll get productivity in a network. I think for parts of the cloudification, it could be 50, 70 percent productivity. You have a, you know, no, I have a big. No, you explained it very well, Jimmy. I mean, I think that it's very simple. You disconnect the hardware and the software, and suddenly you can do things we have never yeah. done in the network before. We have been on that journey now for many years with our intelligent edge network. So, and that is enabling the 5G later on because you need to have it uh, disconnected in order to have a chance to actually have the reliance, uh, the security, and all these latency and speed, speed and throughput. So, yes. Steve, you've been sitting here sort of yeah. silently listening. Does it all make sense to you? It does. I think, I think what's interesting is there are several hundred billion dollar companies that essentially work in the hybrid cloud. And you should think of that as the first step toward the real dream, which is how do I get the computing and the data close together so I can make real-time decisions. The economic value that will come out of that, the business model evolution, the way in which the winners and losers, really a lot of winners, we think, uh, will develop, it'll be tremendous. So how does that, ha how does that actually happen? I well, mean, we're talking about moving the computing power sure. from where it is right now to yeah, the edge of the network, right? Well, what's so, but I'll tell you what's interesting is, um, the trend is undeniable. I mean, the number of meetings that you can have, you know, places like this, just everybody's interested in doing it. Now, you know, we've been in this industry, I've been in this industry for three generations of cellular. This is the one that is, has the, the easiest sell with enterprise because they all realize the strength of it. So the, the point now is how do we get the technology at scale 
How do we get partnerships across companies? Because really no one company can do this. And so that's what you're seeing a lot of excitement and, and you know, energy about right now. Just to, to hop on to Steve's point on market size, you know, hybrid cloud's market is about a 1.2 trillion. And interestingly of it, 50% is services, is what we just talked about. And then new markets, like what we just talked about, in my mind, to cloudify these networks, to us, that's a $50 billion new market that's out there. So this is a lot of new creation, not necessarily, and there'll be some obviously cannibalization that's out there, but there are actually, David, new markets to be formed. And I think hybrid clouds it because you're going to connect things across all different points of where the data happens to be. And so much isn't done today because of latency. Yeah. Because if you're doing a remote surgery, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't have it pause, right? And, right? So this That's latency, well, Hans, what is the latency? What we, would you We are expect? planning to go down to 15 milliseconds based yeah. on latency, and you would have on a 4G network maybe 100 at best. So it's dramatic change. And I think that I agree with both of them. We don't understand, or I, I think we understand, this transformation, of the, this G is much broader than the previous Gs. And, and when I talk to enterprises, they, they see it and they understand it. They do, they get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they ha also have infrastructure already, so they need to do a migration. It's not like changing a smartphone here. You need to change a lot of other stuff. So that's why we have said, and just to give you an indication, we have said, said that significant revenues for us is 2022, but the work is happening now. That's why we launched 5G Mobile Edge Compute right now. That's why we talk to all the partners. That's why we talk to enterprises right now, because this is a transformation of size for a factory, for a, a warehouse, for a retail store, uh, or for a private 5G network for a hospital. All of that is transformation that needs to take place and planned with technology, service, integration, and all of that. So, Steve, how much time do you spend with enterprises? I mean, we've talked a lot about, obviously, IP at yep. Qualcomm and how it figures prominently into the business overall. Are you there already? Are there things that have yet to come that you're going to be asked to, to create, essentially, in terms of the ability of, of your chipsets and your IP to accomplish? But the reality is we, we have been spending a lot of time. If you look at, and it starts really with what we put in the standards bodies to enable this from a technology point of view. Yeah. We, we did that five years ago. We actually did yeah, that like, yeah. in, in, in previous lives uh, <laughs> it, it, with Hans. And, and, uh, but in addition, there's a reason why we have an enterprise Wi-Fi business uh, and a strong one is because we know that those worlds will collide. And uh, we think that's a very big opportunity. So we've assembled assets partnerships and, and, and technology to really enable this. And that's consistent with what we've done in the history of the companies. Bet on things 10 years before they happen, but we, we definitely have a lot of conviction that this trend is, is, a, is an attractive one. Well, Ginny, a significant trend like this that we're sort of trying to flesh out here also creates both opportunity, but also can create danger to a certain extent. Markets can change dramatically. How do you think about it when you potentially are going up against the likes of Microsoft and AWS who may also choose to move closer to yeah. the edge and offer many of those same services. Yeah, actually I view it very different. I view this as pure opportunity to you us. Do. Because with Red Hat already in 120 telcos and operators of the world as a base, you actually need an open source foundation. I, I believe, I think Hans does too, you need some sort of open foundation here out in the network. And then to Steve's point, it's hybrid cloud, so the network's got to connect to a lot of other things. So this really does give them the basis to have an open, because you want all this innovation to come in. This is not about one company providing all the answers. If he has a software-defined network, Cloudify it, you're going to want to bring in innovation from lots of places, but you need a base underneath that, which Red Hat already has a foundation for. And so it's really something to build on that is very different. So that's pure opportunity for us, like I said, a $50 billion segment over the years to come. But the other part, I think both my colleagues said it well, what we're doing with the uh, enterprises now, this is all reimagination of work. Mm. So this is all brand new kind of work. You're not cannibalizing. So really the goal there is to get in with design wins with clients in early experimentation, and then they will have to traverse their current operations to the new which is what comes back into a hybrid cloud so that you can decide to run your work wherever you need to run it when you're ready. And when I'm ready to go to the edge, I can. Because, David, I can't, I can't like overestimate enough. It's 5G technology. It's also the cloudification of the network. And the third element is edge computing. So it's the convergence of these three that make it so different for an enterprise. And, and I think, I, guys, I think we do all agree that in the enterprise, perhaps some of the first use cases we see that we're all working on 
our what, what I would call I'm calling them fixed perimeter, meaning yeah, I agree. go to a factory, a factory, make it wireless, right? Yes, Do you right. realize that what that would mean to a factory, the flexibility or predictive maintenance? So what's that going to look like? Huh? No, it's going to be a, initially just a private 5G network for yeah. a factory. We build right. a, we build a mobile edge compute for the factory. And then the factory needs some application and software on top of it, which we probably don't have. And then you put that on top in Edge. And then you compute and storage everything in the factory so you can take quick decisions. You can uh, reconfigure all your robotics in the factory, etc. So that's the first use. Or a campus, campus that has, that has a 5G uh, private network. So that's the first use cases where many of the enterprises immediately say, this we can do. Uh, but I, I want to come back to what uh, Steve said as well about... Uh, are you ready? I mean, if you build according to the standard, which not everyone will do, I, I claim that Verizon will do, uh, uh, then, of course, these capabilities will come out. And the reason I say not everyone will do is if you only have a consumer business, you, mi you might not build all the eight capabilities. Verizon, we have all the customers, all the way from government, IoT, small and large, right. uh, super big enterprises, consumer. So that's why we build it, because we're going to serve all the customer base. So it's not clear how everyone's going to do. But in our case, we believe in the all eight currencies going to be extremely important for our customer base to transform. And that goes for consumer as well, because they're going to get benefits for sure. Uh, without a doubt. One can understand, having listened to this conversation, why it's got implications beyond just what it means for the enterprise, but for the national interest. And it yeah. certainly is. Is an important dialogue going on right now in terms of us versus China. Hans, I'd like to you to respond. The Pentagon's Defense Innovation Board released a report this year that said carriers to date have not demonstrated deployment capability that would deliver high speeds to large parts of the U.S. population. And the Defense Inv Innovation Board went on to say the country that owns 5G will own future innovations. And right now, with our policies, that country is currently not likely to be the United States. You agree with that? Yeah, uh, I think that in general, remember what I said, we're not building a standard and the standard is based on all the patterns from all the players in the industry and then equipment and whatever is built on top of that. So that's, of course, a very unique way of the telecom industry. You share patterns between competitors and then you build a standard. It's the reason why you afford your phone is working in any country in the world. And we can say that because you are part of that industry. So. Uh, so, of course, then after that, that's when you win the game. How you build it, how you create the So we shouldn't be judging at this point? It's no, too yeah, early it's to too say early. that I mean, we're... To be honest, the first commercial 5G home in the world was Verizon. The first 5G network with smartphone was Verizon in the world. So uh, if that is an indication where we are, I think we're doing pretty well. But the next step with enterprise is going to be very important for how we use 5G and how we transform. Well, this is going to be an extraordinarily important part of our GDP eventually, it would seem. Mm -hmm. I mean, Steve, we talk about you. You know the Chinese fairly well. You yep. do a lot of business there. Are they ahead of us? You know, it's um, they're going at it with a lot of intensity. What is different this time around is the speed to which uh, the Chinese are deploying relative to the leadership that may be established other places. For example, in, traditionally in cellular, it would launch in Verizon or maybe Japan, and, and, yeah. and then it might be several years before you get a tremendous amount of intensity with deployment in China. Not the case this time. You're seeing a lot of deployment intensity early on. Now, of course, it's, it's always um, a little bit more uh, opaque as to what exactly is going on, but I can tell you there's a lot of intensity, and the delay between those two milestones um, very short this time. And I think that's just an indication of how important the technology is. Are we going to be capable of keeping up with, if not exceeding their ability to deploy, given, as you point out, they sort of have more of a command control economy than we do, and the ability to obviously order things to happen that here have to go by the rule of law? Well, I do know that uh, there's a lot of uh, activity occurring uh, in the United States, not only by Hans, but other, other players. Uh, a lot of activity happening in Europe, a lot of activity already happened in Korea and happening in Japan. Japan actually launched this this week or last week with the Rugby World Cup. Uh, so it's just tremendous amount of activity, much more concentrated in time than what we've seen in other in Do other. Do we have the ability, I mean, without using, sorry. Well, ahead, no, I, I was just gonna add, you, you can measure one element of success by how fast does 5G roll out, but to get the real benefit, the reason yeah. I'm the third uh, yeah, no, partner in this yeah. is that as all of these providers have in, in, all realized, 
you've got to then put it to work. And it's going to go to work, and that means the companies have to innovate. Yeah. And so I see the most activity going on on companies trying to think about how to change what they do in the United States. Okay, So in the United States and in Europe is where I see a majority of that focus, David. So I, I think asking about deployment is very important, and it is one piece, but then you have to use it to get the benefit of innovation. And so I think there's two sides of that coin that will, in, in the end, determine the winner. It's and, and Hans, the inability to use anything from Huawei? Does that in any way hobble us in terms of the ability to deploy in a rapid fashion? Apparently not. That's who we're first in the world. No, we are not using Huawei. We're using uh, right, provi you're not. Uh, providers from Europe and, uh, and actually Asia as well, from Korea. And it's working very nice. So, of course, we're taking uh, the brunt with some other leading companies in the world, taking technology first. But uh, I think that uh, the U.S. companies are prepared for that. I mean, Verizon is prepared to work with the with the, the infrastructure players to go there. So now um, we, we feel really good about our base of supply chain to build the network. Steve, you agree? I do. I think we probably have a broader footprint, so we see it you know, worldwide. Yes. It's um, a it's, uh, very global business, and, and it will be for a long time. I mean, for decades, it will continue to be a global business.